I came here actually from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, when I moved to Utah about five and a half years ago, I had actually been here for a weekend but had never been here before. And I came to Utah because there's opportunity here. Um, and for young people like Eddie and I, I think um, at some of the places where we train, there's not a lot of leadership opportunities and growth opportunities for somebody who's doing ID and antibiotic stewardship particularly. So this has been a really exciting place for both of us to be. Um, and so we're really excited to be here. So today, um, I outlined some objectives, hopefully, that at the end um, that you all will be able to sort of take home and ponder. Um, to begin with, just going to define antimicrobial stewardship. And I'll start by saying you'll hear both the terms antimicrobial and then antibiotic stewardship. And CDC sort of has their term. There's nothing uh, hidden in these. Antimicrobial, that word just encompasses all antimicrobials, antifungals, antivirals, in addition to antibiotics. But clearly, so what stewardship uh, programs mainly focus on is trying to improve antibiotic use, but I tend to use the word antimicrobial, but they're interchangeable. Um, I want you to be able to appreciate uh, why we need to have antimicrobial stewardship programs and really the impact that we can have. Um, describe different team members, and I think um, a lot of us are in this room are going to have to get creative about who the team members are, and I'm going to probably talk to you a little bit about what an ideal stewardship program might look like and, and uh, admittedly biased from my experience in academic medical centers. Um, but uh, hopefully, and Eddie has more expertise in this than I do, start to be able to help you guys be creative and troubleshoot in your smaller hospitals as to who your team members can be. Um, and then hopefully just at the end of the day, you'll be able to take home practical tips. And if nothing else, I think, um, again, like Karen said, having, um, I mean, uh, the, the uh, colleagues and mentorship among yourselves in this room and then being able to reach out to Eddie and I. So what is antimicrobial stewardship? So there um, are guidelines on this, and I think um, what antimicrobial stewardship really is is better defined uh, probably in the last three or four years than it has been in the past. But this is just to provide you a reference. Um, there were, this is an updated guideline. There was a prior guideline that was not as clear, I would say, and as specific on what antimicrobial stewardship is and what a stewardship program should actually do. Um, but this is uh, the, the guideline that came out last year. And really, stewardship is a multidisciplinary program. I work with pharmacists, um, my microbiology lab, uh, infection control quality. Um, so it's a multidisciplinary multi group of people with our goal is really just to improve patient outcomes um, by improving antibiotic use. It's not really just about the antibiotic to me and just trying to get people to stop using antibiotics. It's because the antibiotic is in a pathway to potentially causing adverse effects, whether it's resistance in a patient or C. difficile colitis or altering their microbiome. Um, antibiotics are not benign. Uh, and so the whole goal of our program is to improve um, antibiotic use, which will then subsequently improve patient outcomes. CDC, and I, I think I saw some of this in front of you guys, um, has clearly uh, better defined again in the last two or three years um, what stewardship is. And I'll refer you to the core elements document. Um, which I think, again, some of you have, and you can find it online. Uh, and they have really defined what stewardship is. Um, there's a lot of details in the document, but it really comes down to what they call seven core elements. Um, and we're going to go through a lot of these things, but really it's having leadership commitment. It sounds like there are a lot of leaders for your hospitals in this room. So hopefully this is an evidence of leadership commitment to stewardship. Having accountability, which is really a single leader, ideally a physician leader, but I'm going to tell you it doesn't have to be a physician leader by any uh, means, but a leader who's accountable for the outcomes of the program is really dedicated to the program. Drug expertise is a, sense, a, a single pharmacist leader. I think the pharmacist in your hospitals are probably far more important than the physician is actually in some ways because the pharmacist does the day-to-day -day work and that's who you guys are going to have available and there's a lot of pharmacists in this room. Um, so the pharmacist is important. Action uh, is the fourth uh, core element, and action is really just the day-to-day -day activities and what we are, what we are doing in stewardship um, and the, the actions and the activities that we do to improve antibiotic use. Uh, tracking uh, is some method to monitor antibiotic prescribing, and there are some basic ways to do that, and we can help you all troubleshoot at your local facilities. Um, ideally, if you're tracking something, whether it's a quantity of antibiotic use, it's some sort of measure of quality of antibiotic use, maybe it's your C. diff infections, you should be reporting those to people. It makes you accountable and also shows the impact of your program. Uh, and then the seventh core element is education, and that can be fancy or can be um, not all that fancy, but essentially educating patients and providers uh, about the importance of, uh, of minimizing unnecessary or improving antibiotic use. 
So I'd, I'd refer you to that document and the, at the very end of it is a checklist essentially that you can go through where it gets into details uh, of all of those seven core elements and examples uh, of different um, you know, leadership accountability type statements, action, actions or activities that you can do. At our hospital at the University of Utah, we used that uh, checklist as essentially a gap analysis when we started the stewardship program or we're trying to get uh, funding for a pharmacist to figure out where we had holes uh, and uh, gaps that we needed to fill. So I think it's good to walk through um, down the road. <clears throat> Another way to think about what stewardship is, um, it's really trying with a whole host of mechanisms and different people involved to make sure that the patients who get antibiotics are the right patients. And by that, I mean patients who really have infections. And if we're talking about antibiotics, they have bacterial infections for which antibiotics work. Uh, making sure that the right patient gets the right drugs, usually that it's the narrowest spectrum drug uh, or antibiotic that we can use for a particular infection, that it's at the right dose, it's the right route, essentially trying to often use oral antibiotics instead of IV antibiotics when we don't have to because they're expensive and can come with other adverse effects from catheters, um, and for the right duration. There's an evolving literature more and more an ID <clears throat> about uh, what the appropriate durations of therapy are for many infections, and it's, it's shorter than what most people um, treat, so um, really trying to minimize excess antibiotics. I'd say again, sort of what are our goals? Um, stewardship is really about optimizing, again, patient safety, um, because antibiotics can create a whole lot of uh, situations that are not safe for patients, whether it's C. difficile infection, it's just diarrhea in the hospital or at home and they have to get up and go to the bathroom and fall, adverse events from having catheters for IV antibiotics that they don't need, or other sort of long-term uh, effects of altering the microbiome that we're starting to figure out more and more. Um, this is really a patient safety issue, um, and so that is the main goal. I really believe and have seen that if you optimize patient safety, uh, and outcomes and just do antibiotic stewardship with that as your main focus, you'll save money, you'll decrease costs, you'll decrease length of stay. Um, and resistance, antimicrobial resistance, is a sort of another big picture goal. I don't have it in the forefront of my mind when I'm trying to promote uh, good antibiotic use. I'm really thinking about a particular patient and not wanting them to get C. diff. Um, or uh, you know have um, you know liver toxicity or renal toxicity from antibiotics, um, but I have seen at our VA that we have started to reduce uh, some of our gram-negative antibiotic resistance by reducing uh, broad-spectrum antibiotic use. So that is a bigger public health, big picture goal is to reduce antibiotic resistance, and that is something that I think will clearly um, happen if you can reduce antibiotic use. But it's hard to measure. It's hard to prove. Um, um, and it shouldn't be a sort of the first thing that we're, that we're looking to, to impact at our local institutions. <clears throat> so that's sort of what antibiotic stewardship is, hopefully, uh, gives you a sense. Um, and so let's take a big step back uh, and say why does antibiotic stewardship, excuse me, or antimicrobial stewardship exist, and why is this important? Um, there is no doubt uh, that antibiotics have saved countless lives. If you just go back uh, to medical publications or pictures that existed before, essentially uh, sulfur drugs, which were the first drugs, or penicillin came out in the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s. There's no doubt that antibiotics have really revolutionized medicine and saved countless lives and allowed us to, to pursue uh, aggressive treatments such as stem cell transplants, solid organ transplants, uh, et cetera. Um, but their use is not benign or risk neutral. There is always uh, a potential uh, adverse outcome from using antibiotics. Um, and, you know, antibiotic resistance, you can see it sometimes in individual patients it happens, but I think, again, it's happening more globally uh, on a public health uh, level. And patients come in contact with each other in the community, but more so even in the hospital, and these resistance mechanisms and bacteria can be transmitted um, from patient to patient. Um, and so, you know, that's why this is really important from a public health standpoint, because we do as humans share bacteria, uh, even with agriculture and with animals and with um, uh, other sort of organisms in, in, in the world. Um, at least, and I think this is an underestimate, 5% of hospitalized patients uh, experience some sort of adverse uh, reaction um, from antibiotics, and those can take uh, a lot of different forms, whether it's some sort of rash, nephrotoxicity, liver toxicity, clostridium difficile infection, and I would just even say routine diarrhea, uh, which is uh, uncomfortable for patients. Um, uh, and a, so, something happening from an antibiotic is very, very common if you actually talk to people. 
Um, and on top of this, um, you know, uh, increased risk of adverse effects and antibiotic resistance um, developing, and I'm going to show you some data uh, at alarming sort of rates in the antibiotic resistant infections becoming more common. Um, there are fewer and fewer antibiotics being developed. Uh, you know, the last five years, there's been somewhat of an uptick in antibiotic uh, research and development, um, but there are very few antibiotics that are novel mechanisms against um, a lot of these resistant gram-negative organisms that are being developed. So we really need to try and preserve uh, and be good stewards of the drugs that we have uh, currently. When I talk to, uh, I do a lot of teaching of medical students at the University of Utah and health staff, um, one way, and this, somebody said this to me is essentially why I say it, um, and I, it sort of took me aback when I thought about it. I try and tell them that, you know, when antibiotics are the only drug that they use in one person that has an impact on anybody else. If they use antihypertensives, they use, um, you know, anti-cholesterol medications, some anticoagulants, chemotherapy, et cetera, whether it works or doesn't work in a potential, uh, a particular patient has really zero impact for the next patient they see with X, Y, or Z condition. Um, that is not the case at all for antibiotics. Whether we're talking about <clears throat> giving antibiotics to one patient and they get C. difficile infection, and then that can be transmitted to the next person uh, in the room or somebody else that we take care of, or if a particular patient develops antibiotic-resistant uh, E. coli, um, how we use antibiotics in one person impacts you know, the next patient and really impacts all of us. Um, so we have to use them, and it's hard for people to sort of change this mindset and think about your particular patient, and, but also think about a public health sort of global standpoint. Um, and then the other piece, like I said a minute ago, without antibiotics, there is no way that we would be where we are currently with stem cell transplant programs, solid organ transplant programs, a lot of the biologic uh, immunosuppressive treatments we have for you know, chronic autoimmune rheumatologic diseases. Uh, and the ability to keep advancing these fields is really threatened uh, by antibiotic resistance um, and essentially also the lack of new antibiotics uh, sort of being developed. So we really, again, have to be good stewards uh, and promote best use of the drugs that we have left. Uh, another piece that always needs to be sort of in, in our mindset is that all antibiotics fail. Um, antibiotics, as many of you know, especially the original antibiotics, and then they've you know, been sort of newer drugs developed and mod chemically modified, but antibiotics come from organisms, bacteria, fungi, uh, in uh, the environment. And so, uh, and there's been multiple studies that have been published looking uh, at the microbiome of, uh, you know, whether it's the permafrost up in the uh, Arctic or um, in isolated caves. Uh, and there's even a newer study that show that antibiotic resistance exists uh, in nature before we even start to introduce clinically uh, human sort of, uh, or even agriculture use of antibiotics. So it's just a matter of time before we see antibiotic uh, resistance once a drug is released to market. Uh, on the top here are the years that these various antibiotics uh, were released for clinical use, and here you see on the bottom uh, the year that antibiotic resistance was first observed clinically. Uh, and the specific years are not important, but just to show you that basically within a couple of years, it varies from drug to drug, and vancomycin clearly has persisted uh, as a very um, um, reliable antibiotic for many years, but for everything else, resistance develops usually within three, four, five, six years, uh, and it is detected clinically after the drug is introduced for use. So that is going to happen with every antibiotic that we ever start using, even new ones that are coming down the pipeline. Um, this data is somewhat outdated, um, but this is uh, CDC's <clears throat> drug resistance report threat that came out in 2013, and this was really their first attempt, uh, and we don't have uh, great surveillance systems or really any significant surveillance systems in this country, but their attempt at uh, really quantifying antibiotic resistance in the United States and, and sort of, um, I guess you could guess, grading the importance of different antibiotic resistance organisms. Um, and, and at the time, they estimated that about two uh, million uh, patients in this country are, 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 uh, become um, uh, ill with an antibiotic resistant infection yearly, uh, and that those result in about 23,000 deaths. For Clostridium difficile infection, which um, they quantify as an antibiotic resistant infection because most patients who get antibiotics develop C. diff because it is actually resistant to the antibiotic that they're getting for X, Y, or Z other infection, and it's, uh, it, it's sort of an antibiotic resistant infection itself. They estimate about 250,000 <coughs> patients get C. diff each year. I would say that these numbers have been sort of recalibrated or calculated in the New England Journal a year or two after this, and it's probably actually twice that number, uh, but roughly 250 to 400,000 uh, illnesses a year from C. diff and about 15 to 30,000 deaths. 
Um, and then there's also data sort of quantifying the frequency of al allergic reactions and adverse events and essentially that patients are coming to the ER because they have rashes or uh, uh, toxicities from antibiotics. There's a whole host of, of uh, adverse events. Um, and sort of thinking a little bit more about resistant bacteria, and I think one of the ones that we in the health department worry about the most is carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae. So many of you know Enterobacteriaceae is essentially the large family of enteric gram-negative rods, human um, uh, gram-negative bacteria. And carbapenems are the broadest spectrum, really at this point, uh, antibiotic uh, that we have to use for any bacteria. Uh, and carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae were first reported uh, to CDC from North Carolina in 2001. And by 2013, and I will just tell you, as of now, if you go on CDC's website, there's been a carbon penum resistant Enterobacteriaceae reported in every state in the country. There's different mechanisms that have been reported with different frequency uh, in different states. But this rapidly spread essentially across the continental and out of the continental United States uh, as well. And so um, that paired with this very alarming case from Nevada from last year. I don't know how many of you have heard of this patient. There was a patient um, who uh, came to Nevada, a 70-year-old woman, August of last year, so last summer, after she had had a prolonged stay in India, uh, had had multiple hospitalizations and orthopedic procedures there for a femur fracture and developed osteomyelitis or infection of her bone. Uh, and when she came back, she was admitted to a hospital in Nevada uh, early August, uh, had wound cultures from the, the infected uh, bone that grew a Klebsiella pneumoniae, so an enteric gram-negative rod that was carbapenem resistant. Um, the mechanism was detected, and it was this particular enzyme. Um, and then, you know, further testing was done at CDC and, and verified, uh, and essentially this was a pan-resistant uh, bacteria. And this is the first time in the United States that we've ever seen a patient um, with a pan-resistant, essentially we had nothing that we could treat it with, uh, bacteria, uh, and she died in early September. Um, and, you know, there, there's a lot to this story. I mean, she came from India where there um, is a lot of antibiotic use and a lot of antibiotic resistance. But it just, so, you know, this was probably an imported resistance uh, mechanism, no doubt. Um, but these people can show up at our hospitals any day from all over the world. Um, and this is the reality that we now live in. And a lot of people have sort of warned about a post-antibiotic era. And this is a patient, essentially, who is part of the post-antibiotic era for which we have no treatment uh, for her infection. And so these kinds of patients should stay on our mind is what should drive us in a lot of ways um, uh, to promote good antibiotic use and do antibiotic stewardship. I mentioned before that there's uh, <clears throat> decreasing um, numbers of antibiotics being developed. This is a, I've adapted this over time from a paper from Brad Spellberg. And these are uh, essentially on the x-axis, it's just uh, uh, years, uh, and on the y-axis is number of antibiotics that were FDA approved uh, in these various time periods. And as you can see, I mean, obviously there's a precipitous drop off from 1983 through about 2012, um, with a little bit of an uptick um, in the last four years or so, I would point out that this uptick is due to some, let's um, <clears throat> just say, uh, incentiv incentivizing uh, of drug companies uh, and po private public partnerships. But I would also point out that most of the drugs in this uh, six group, uh, this group of six here, are for gram resistant gram positive infections, so MRSA, uh, somewhat for VRE. Uh, a class of bacteria for which I think we really still have quite good antibiotics, vancomycin, daptomycin. We don't really need antibiotics for resistant gram-positive infections as much as we do for resistant gram-negative infections. So this is concerning, uh, the drop-off in development of new antibiotics. And if you go back, you know, to that timeline I showed before, for many, many years, you know, 30, 40 years, uh, an antibiotic would become resistant and drug companies would just spit out another one. And they were always sort of keeping up uh, with resistance and developing new antibiotics. Um, but because the drug development process is so incredibly expensive, takes many, many years, um, there are people like me who say don't use that antibiotic um, and patients only take them for a short amount of time as opposed to an antihypertensive or so that you might take your whole life. Drug companies have really gotten out of the drug development process um, and, uh, or sorry, gotten out of the antibiotic um, uh, sort of uh, area and gone on to different types of drugs because it's just not profitable and they cannot re recoup their cost. So this is a problem and this is being worked on, uh, again, through some of our ID professional societies and in Congress to try and um, figure out better finances essentially uh, and economics behind this. But this is something, again, that we need to be thinking about uh, as we prescribe antibiotics. Uh, there 
is a wealth of data just showing that we misuse antibiotics. This is just one particular paper, uh, mainly from CDC and some others as well, but essentially uh, using multiple data sources, tried to get at um, uh, the frequency of antibiotic use for inpatients, so hospitalized patients in this country, uh, what they are used for, and the opportunities for improvement, or another way to say it is maybe the, uh, the amount of antibiotic use that is inappropriate or unnecessary. Uh, and this is based on 2010 data, but almost 60% of inpatients uh, who uh, come to our, our hospitals for X, Y, or Z reason, by the time they leave, almost 60% will have received an antibiotic of some sort. Those tend to be most commonly for pneumonia, for urinary tract infections, and for sort of empiric or presumptive use uh, or coverage for resistant gram-positive infections, and that's MRSA essentially is what people are trying to, or worried about, or thinking that they need to cover. Um, to think, on that note, I sometimes wonder, and I worry about with different crowds that I present to, if talking about antibiotic resistance and the, the increased rate of antibiotic resistance is kind of counterproductive and that it makes people, when they see an individual patient, almost overthink that they have a resistant infection and start to think that they need to use broader and broader spectrum antibiotics. And I think that has somewhat happened with MRSA. People have become more knowledgeable about MRSA. Almost they worry about it too much in a lot of situations and worry that their patients have MRSA when they don't. But I think this data shows a lot of people are using that empiric vancomycin. Um, a lot of antibiotic use in hospitals is broad spectrum, um, and basically about a third of it, I personally think in many situations far more than a third of it, uh, is completely unnecessary or avoidable. Um, so there's ample room to improve uh, antibiotic use is the point here. And how are people misusing or overusing antibiotics? There's lots of different potential ways. One way is unnecessary antibiotic use. So this can happen in patients and very frequently happens outpatients. One example outpatient is patients, people who have colds, upper respiratory tract infections, uh, for which 99% uh, you know, of those infections are viral uh, and there's no need for an antibiotic. So that's unnecessary use. There's other examples in, in hospitals. I see a lot of patients with pancreatitis who are treated with antibiotics, but pancreatitis 99 times out of 100 is not an infection. Um, and uh, so, you know, unnecessary antibiotic use is treating a non-infectious uh, syndrome, and that's really getting at the right patient. We only want to give antibiotics to patients who have bacterial infections. Overly broad spectrum is, uh, you know, again, very common. Most people only use vancomycin or vancomirapenem for a lot of inpatients, regardless of what you have. And it, it takes, you know, some some experience and some knowledge to know what the right drug is, but that's where. Um, folks in this room and Eddie and I can, can help people really pick narrow spectrum antibiotics. Um, incorrect dosing and, and route is another way that antibiotics may be misused. And then I think, again, you know, sort of the first one and the last one are the, are the most common. We prescribe way too long, of course, as of antibiotics. And partly that's because a lot, we don't know for a lot of infections what the right, what the shortest effective duration is. Um, but I think there's no doubt for many infections we treat far longer than we really need to. So antibiotic stewardship programs, thinking about <clears throat> what I just showed you about the rates of adverse events, drug-resistant infections, you know, diminishing uh, drug development. Uh, antibiotic stewardship programs in multiple different settings have really been shown um, to help <laughs> with, with a lot of these problems. Um, there's no doubt that we can Im Im uh, improve patient outcomes, I think is the way to say it. Um, there's lots of data that antibiotic stewardship programs actually help pati a single patient with X, Y, or Z infection actually um, get out of the hospital faster, have lower relapse rates, et cetera. Uh, we can reduce C. difficile infection rates, improve patient safety, a lot of different ways that you want to look at it, um, and save money. Um, and uh, this is harder and harder to do nowadays with many antibiotics being generic, but there's, I can help you with some sort of savvy ways to think about quantifying money that you can save. And again, I, you know, this is a public health imperative, um, so that's another reason why we have to do antibiotic stewardship. And then I think the sort of elephant in the room is that we are all going to have to do this, and, and a lot of uh, places already have to do this based on Joint Commission accreditation. And the regulatory or policy 
um, sort of pushes for antibiotic stewardship really took an accelerated pace, uh, I would say, about uh, five or so years ago, specifically in 2014, 2015, around that time, uh, the Obama administration uh, released an executive order, again, urged by uh, really a committee of, um, of advisors, uh, scientific advisors within the ID community specifically, um, but an executive order on combating antibiotic resistance that really outlined in subsequent documents a national action plan. And it, contains a whole host of things that really we should be doing in human and health services uh, is, is trying to get done. But one of those particular things to combat antibiotic resistance is development and requirement of antibiotic stewardships across all of healthcare, whether it's big hospitals, little hospitals, inpatient, outpatient, long-term care facilities, et cetera. Um, on the heels of that, the Joint Commission uh, proposed standards for antimicrobial stewardship hospitals in uh, November 2015 and then finalized that document uh, in 2016. And those of you that are accredited by the Joint Commission hopefully know uh, that uh, as of January 1st of this year, it technically is required and it can be surveyed uh, that you are supposed to have an antibiotic stewardship program. Um, there has been a uh, proposed uh, condition of participation from CMS uh, for antibiotic stewardship programs. That rule has not been finalized um, and uh, I am confident it will be. I don't think at the pace that we anticipated before the election last November. Um, but that will be required regardless of your accreditor, I think, at some point within the next uh, two years. Um, and there already is a final Medicare rule uh, for long-term care facilities that all long-term care facilities are required now to have uh, uh, stewardship programs uh, as a condition of participation or reimbursement. So we really should do this because it's the right thing to do, but there's a lot of things in medicine that we should have done a long time ago because they were the right things to do, but don't really happen, of course, until somebody, uh, uh, there, there are dollar signs uh, attached to it. So this is the, um, hopefully you all have seen it, but I, I put the, the website on the bottom here. This is uh, Joint Commission's uh, new antimicrobial uh, stewardship standard. Again, it was effective January 1st, 2017, and there's not a whole lot of detail in it. Uh, you can look closer at the uh, sort of uh, the draft or the surveyor uh, documents as to specifics, but I'll just tell you it looks exactly pretty much close, to, uh, mimics the CDC's core elements uh, and really uh, suggests that you have the seven core elements to some degree, um, and it really mirrors, mirrors that language quite closely. So that was a very fast overview of what antimicrobial stewardship is and why we should have it. I'm going to go into, uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to, to interrupt me as we go. Um, but I think we have the right people in the room to start talking about, I know some of you have antimicrobial stewardship programs, some of you don't, at various sort of stages of development. But I'm just going to go through a very, again, it's not very detailed, but sort of some of the, go through the core elements uh, and give you examples uh, of how to implement some of these, um, you know, examples of, of leadership statements, et cetera, um, and uh, just feel free to interrupt me as we go, okay? So ideally, um, for a stewardship program, who do you need on your team? So again, CDC says there should be an accountability piece and a drug expertise piece, and the accountability piece, they say, ideally, uh, is a physician leader to really have accountability for the program. I don't think that that is necessarily the case in every hospital, nor can it be the case in every hospital. But really, the role of that person, whatever their, you know, sort of letters after their name are, uh, is that they are a leader who is passionate about antimicrobial stewardship, and they are going to take the leadership and the accountability to keep the program moving forward. Uh, and to really, it needs to be somebody ideally who is passionate and believes in all the things that I just told you, um, and is just something that they really, really care about. Um, I am the medical director of stewardship at our VA and also at the University of Utah Hospital. And I'll tell you, I've been the one who's been the advocate. There was no stewardship happening at either place before I came. Um, and I just really like the, uh, antibiotic stewardship and believe in these principles. Um, and it probably doesn't it probably would not have mattered, to be honest with you, if I was or wasn't an ID physician. It was that I cared and I was persistent. I like building relationships and convincing people about things, I could say. Um, and so I have built and I'm continuing to build, you know, two different programs at very different type hospitals. So the leader really um, has most of the interactions, whether it's with the medical staff, the leadership, pharmacist. I mean, I interact with everybody uh, at all different levels within the hospital. Um, and then I take responsibility for the program. I mean, essentially that is my, my role. I have a vision for it. Um, and then I, t I sort of, you know, set up every meeting and try and 
um, build all those critical uh, relationships. I will say, however, um, I have one at the VA, and now in August we'll have another pharmacist at the University of Utah who I could not do this without. So at the VA, I did all the stewardship day to day, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, by myself for three years. Um, if I say by myself, but I sort of grabbed a few random pharmacists here and there on different days to help me. But that was not sustainable. I needed more people and I needed somebody who had access to pharmacy data and was able to sort of review patients and do the day-to-day -day work. Um, so the pharmacists, and I call, I mean, my, the pharmacists on my teams are leaders as well. We sort of co-lead this together. But a pharmacist ideally is the one who is doing the day-to-day -day work of stewardship. Uh, and again, I'm talking mainly in bigger hospitals. We're going to have to be creative, uh, more creative in some of the smaller hospitals. Uh, but for you all, I would suspect a pharmacist is even more important than the physician pieces, and the pharmacist can be the leader as well. But the pharmacist is on the ground and sort of knows the day-to-day -day, um, uh, use of antibiotics. Ideally, both these people are trained in infectious diseases, but I sometimes think less and less of that. Again, at the VA, when I developed the stewardship program, I had no ID trained pharmacists, and our medicine pharmacists, and our surgical pharmacists, I mean, all of, a lot of this was talking about pneumonia, urinary tract infections, skin and soft tissue infections, cellulitis. They, once I told them about things once or twice, I mean, this, they were able to do all of this very easily, and I probably would have been fine down the road without an ID pharmacist if I could have had just a dedicated person, but they were adding it on to other things that they were doing. Um, but there's, there's also a, a certain personality, I think, and skill set, and you have to feel comfortable talking to people about things that may be uncomfortable. So that, that's something to, to sort of think about. Um, so, so that's sort of the accountability piece, and the drug expertise piece. But again, like I said at the beginning, this is multidisciplinary, and these are a snapshot of all the different groups, and I'm sure I'm missing some that I work with, uh, you know, not all day today, but really throughout a week or throughout a month um, because I need all these people. I need microbiology to help me interpret micro results uh, and think about different tests that we want to do and things that we want to report to providers to help them improve antibiotic use. I, you know, at my hospital need folks who can help me with our EHR uh, and with data. Um, I sit on um, both the Salt Lake City VA and the University of Utah Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee, essentially. I mean, I kind of admittedly tuned half of it out. If there's something about antibiotics, you know, they ask me, should we bring X, Y, or Z antibiotic on? And I'm like, no, we don't need those drugs. So I'm there basically to control the formulary as far as antimicrobials go. Um, and then I am also the hospital epidemiologist at our VA. But even if I wasn't, I sit on this committee and because the infection control folks and I have um, uh, similar goals as far as reducing antibiotic-resistant infections. Question? available to them. Right. So as resources. As resources. Um, yeah, right, because many of you don't have microbiology departments, et cetera. So I think, um, you know, I'm taking sort of a large hospital 50,000 foot view. Um, you may not have all these people, um, and we're going to talk about as when we get into sort of Eddie's piece and also as a group sort of troubleshooting. Um, I think some of this is easier without all these people, <laughs> and some of this may be harder. Um, I have a lot of people to please. I have a lot of politics I have to wade through. And I think some of you in this room probably fill multiple hats within these different groups here, and that may actually make some of this a little bit more streamlined and easier. Um, but there are also basic stewardship things you can do without getting very creative and doing a whole very fancy things with your microbiology. There are lots of stewardship things you can do um, without even having, you know, electronic health records and with having, uh, you know, paper charts or having uh, not, I would say, the most robust access to data or not even being able to, you know, I use my IT folks to develop a lot of order sets and order menus. There are different ways to get at that. And in some ways I suspect, and I, you know, speaking admittedly from my naivete, that some of this stuff is easier when you have a smaller group of physicians and you have fewer beds than working with a cancer hospital and solid organ transplant physicians, et cetera. So we're going to answer some of these questions, but I think you guys are actually probably better equipped to answer those questions <laughs> in many senses than I am. Um, and that's probably something we can help each other with as we go forward. 
So finding the right team members and sort of getting to that question. Again, here are the core elements. And just to point out that the most important piece in the first three pieces are your, te your leadership commitment and your team members. I just want to point out leadership commitment. There's a whole host of ways to probably show this. And I don't want to just say check the boxes on regulatory uh, surveys, but show this. I think one is this meeting right here is for the leaders in the room is showing that there's leadership commitment to stewardship. Um, I have examples, and I've shared them with some of the folks in the room, and I'm happy to send them around, and you all can copy and plagiarize away. I have stewardship policies uh, at both the Salt Lake City VA and the University of Utah, and essentially I run those up, the appropriate leadership sort of committees to get stamps of approval. I mean, I sell them, and people really believe in them when I'm done with them, but essentially this would also fulfill a sort of leadership um, commitment. Um, and really what these policies are doing, and I'm explaining to people when I present them, is going through and I have little you know, paragraphs in there about the background, the purpose, why, why do we need antimicrobial stewardship, what am I going to do, um, and this sort of the scope so that folks know that I'm gonna work on inpatients, outpatients. I give them a sense of who the team members are. No one's named by name in there um, in case we change staffing but essentially what our responsibilities are, what our scope is, um, the various types of actions or reviews of antibiotics that we might do. Um, and then I've, the accountability piece, I've built in reporting into all of my, uh, my policies, which really says we're gonna report to pharmacy and therapeutics committee. And again, this, you guys may not need to do it with this frequency quarterly. And these are the X, Y, or Z things that we're gonna report, antibiotic use, and the number of interventions or something that we're doing, or I'm gonna to present to the clinical executive board and infection control committee. It makes me accountable and it keeps us thinking ahead. Okay, what's the next thing that we need to report and we need to tell people uh, what our antibiotic use data sort of looks like and give them an update. So I'm happy to share any of these things with anyone because they I didn't actually originally draft them all myself. <laughs> I copied them from other folks as well. The other thing that I think could serve, serve as a sort of leadership statement, and I actually think this document has been really, really helpful. I had a pharmacist I hired about a year ago at the Salt Lake City VA, uh, and he came with this uh, antibiotic stewardship strategic planning document, um, and you don't need to see the details again, I can send it out. It has been really, really helpful for me to sort of think, not only at the VA, but at the U, sort of, okay, what's our six month goals? What's our nine month goals? Where are we going in a year? Where are we going in three years? Um, and I've shared this kind of document with pharmacy leadership, with medical leadership, quality, and this helps people get it. They, they look at this even more than a policy would, and they said, okay, so these are what she says is the focus. These are her core values. This is what they're trying to promote. These are all like, you know, the, the five rights, and this is what they're going to do over the next, you know, one year, 90-day goals, three-year goals, et cetera. Um, so it's helped to show people, but also to get myself organized, and I'm happy to, to sort of share these. To get to your question, um, and Eddie was uh, involved with this work, the National Quality Forum, I guess this was last year, uh, released uh, Antibiotic Stewardship in Acute Care, a Practical Playbook, uh, and Eddie can speak obviously more to this than I can, but I think there, were, there was probably a lot of discussion go that went into this document of folks like you all in this room, in critical access hospitals, small hospitals, rural community hospitals, what tips can we give them um, to really implement these things uh, in their somewhat resource limited settings? And I would refer you to this because they, it essentially walks through the core elements. So it's got sort of like seven sections. And then for each one, it's got some sort of um, anticipated barriers and potential solutions, uh, a lot of resources for different trainings that you might engage in if you had the finances. Um, workarounds, different ways to think about stewardship other than, again, the ideal sort of situation that I'm used to and that I may have just presented. So I would, I would take a look at this document. So sort of thinking about that again, so the, the leadership statement I think is kind of easy, and again, you can steal all that stuff from me, but then when you start to think about people, again, I, we talked about accountability. This is your ideally your ID trained physician leader, which many of, uh, of us are not going to have. Um, and I would read through this section and they point out, you know, it doesn't, and I've even said this, I, I don't know that I had to be an ID physician to do, I happened to go through ID training and that's what got me here. Um, but I think there are definitely ways that I could have gotten interested in this 
through other exposure. Hospitalists are fabulous at antibiotic stewardship, and they are taking care of a lot of these patients day to day. So it doesn't have to be an ID physician. I know surgeons, even at our hospital at the U, who have come up to me and promoted steward. They don't, they're not calling it stewardship, but they're like, hey, why don't you do this or this? I'm like, wow, they're like an antibiotic steward. They don't know that, you know, it's just a, their, their, their mindset is thinking about promoting good antibiotic use. So there is a whole host of different people. It doesn't even have to be a physician. Uh, I think nurse practitioners, mid-levels, um, nurses, pharmacists, there's a lot of different sort of leaders that you can have. Um, I think passion is the, and an interest is the main, main, main uh, point that you need to have. Again, in the playbook, there's resources and references there for stewardship training. There are different courses for pharmacists, for physicians, for both. I would have you look at those references. Um, again, if you're looking for a physician champion or some sort of a leader, I would have you, again, think outside the box. Think about your uh, physicians who may hold other leadership positions or are just really enthusiastic. Um, and think about folks in high impact areas like your emergency medicine group, surgery group, intensive care if you have it, et cetera. And then Eddie's gonna talk about, you know, the other thing is within the Joint Commission, they clearly say in their antimicrobial stewardship standard that you can contract uh, with outside ID physicians for some sort of consultative expertise piece. Um, and uh, Intermountain has a tele uh, ID and stewardship program, and some of you may have received a survey from the U, sort of, it, you we're probably gonna go that way and develop one as well. So you very well may have people at your, at your local facility, but we are blessed in Utah, I think, to have a lot of resources here, so you can reach out to us as well. The drug expertise, again, I don't think this has to be an ID-trained pharmacist. You can get a lot of this training, maybe through us, through some of these other courses and things you'll see in the uh, NQF playbook. Uh, but again, it's mainly interest, somebody who really believes that antibiotic, promoting antibiotic use is, is important, uh, and then you can sort of learn uh, how to use antibiotics appropriately and how to sort of do these things. Um, and, uh, but I would point out again, you know, there's a lot of pharmacists in the room. I think this is great because I think this role is integral and this person in a lot of ways at your facility is probably far more important than having um, a dedicated physician because there's workarounds for the physician piece. One of the things that, uh, you know, an epidemiologist always says is, you know, what doesn't get measured doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about accountability, you don't talk here about the kind of data that you're going to get. Is that Eddie uh, is going to do some of that? Yeah, but I'm I think that some it. simple ways of saying, you know, this is where we are today, and then, um, you know, uh, how do we collect some information that will yeah. help us to I'm gonna, know what we're doing? I don't, this may or may not answer your question. I mean, hard to, some of this is hard hard to all get at um, in, in one session today. Uh, I'm getting to at the end, I was gonna sort of walk through how I built the stewardship program at the VA, which granted, I, I think the VA has clearly some uh, uh, excellent resources for stewardship programs, but it's a smaller hospital. And I was gonna show some data in there that sort of where I started to figure out where there were problems and then how I track things going forward. Um, so let's talk real quick. I'm gonna, again, I was trying to go through the core elements and talk about action. What are the activities that a stewardship program does to improve antibiotic use? And again, this is beyond probably the scope of just one day to day. There's a whole lot of different activities you can do. <laughs> I'm just gonna start there. I'll give you a few examples and my personal examples. But again, would we'll refer you to the core elements, refer you to that checklist. You'll see that they break it into sort of pharmacy-driven interventions. So like IV to oral conversion, therapeutic drug monitoring, sort of you know renal uh, dose adjustments. Uh, there's more, um, uh, let's just say broad um, sort of interventions where you develop a guideline for, okay, this is how we're gonna treat urinary tract infections at this hospital. And that's not labor intensive. It's labor intensive on the front end to develop you know, a, a, a guideline and a sort of protocol but once you, you know, develop it, get buy-in, teach people about that protocol, that shouldn't require a lot of maintenance going forward. Um, but the, again, in big hospitals and places that have large stewardship program, the bulk of activity is really focused on these two sort of side things here, prospective audit and feedback uh, and formulary restriction and preauthorization. And those are fancy ways of saying um, that with you know, pre-prescription approval. This is essentially restricting drugs, if you guys have ever had anything that's restricted at your hospital, um, where essentially it's required to call the stewardship program or call a pharmacist or someone to get approval to use that drug 
uh, before it's dispensed from the pharmacy. Um, and you know, ideally, obviously, the person who's approving it is talking about the case, thinking about the risk of drug resistance, what is the infection we're treating, and helping the prescriber come to the you know, sort of most appropriate antibiotic to use. Um, and then prospective audit and feedback is doing what I just call antibiotic reviews. Um, we do it at the VA pretty much every day. My pharmacist prints out a list of broad spectrum antibiotics that we're interested in reviewing. We look at the charts, we sort of go through the case, we walk around, talk to the teams and make suggestions. You know, every person doesn't need vancomycin. Maybe we can give this person with cellulitis ANSEF instead of giving them zosin because it's caused by strep, things like that. Um, these things potentially are a lot of work. However, again, uh, I would take your lead on this. Depending on the size of your hospital, the number of patients every day that are anti on antibiotics, this actually could take very little time potentially depending uh, on sort of uh, the volume that you have. Uh, and the types of patients, I suspect you guys are seeing a lot of patients with maybe skin and soft tissue infections, maybe some tra trauma-related uh, soft tissue infections, pneumonia and UTIs. And once you get sort of educated in these syndromes, this could be fairly quick, uh, a lot of those antibiotic reviews. Formulary restriction is one other thing, and I refer to being on the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee. Um, I, like for instance, Dalbavancin or Riotavancin, some of these long-acting once a week uh, anti-MRSA drugs, I think they have zero role in our hospital. I've basically sat on P&T to kind of keep these things <laughs> out of the hospital because they're very expensive and, and, and basic patients can get oral antibiotics for those infections. So you can control the formulary by going to a committee a lot of times and, and sort of being the guidance on what antibiotics we should and shouldn't have on formulary. These other two things are really day to day and you can tailor it. Like I don't do antibiotic reviews on the weekend and I'm not doing them today because I'm here. So you can do it once a week, twice a week, seven days a week, sort of whatever fits your needs. If you're gonna restrict something, it's gotta be a little bit more tightly mapped out so that people know what to do overnight, et cetera. <clears throat> so again, the actions, there's a whole lot of different stewardship actions you can do, and I'm happy to talk to people offline. I just don't wanna spend too much time on that today. What I was gonna walk you through was essentially, I, gosh, I've lost track of time. I think it was 2013 when I started at the Salt Lake VA. And again, I did this by myself from the beginning. So I'm just gonna like walk you through what I did over time and I'm still working on this. This has been a slow process. But as a frame of reference, we're a fairly small VA. It's 122 beds. I think technically if you take away the mental health and psych beds, it's about 100 beds. And our daily census is about 85. So it's fairly small. Um, one of the sort of first things I did, and I say hospital A because I use this for a different talk, but one of the first things I did, again, was try and get on this pharmacy and therapeutics committee so I understood what the drugs that we stocked were, what was on our formulary, and I met with the head of pharmacy, and I went through and tried to essentially say, we need to streamline the antibiotics we have available because when you have too many things, people start to do crazy things and not understand how to prescribe them. And I just went through and kind of got rid of duplicative agents. And this is just an example. But for instance, we had mirapenem and amipenem. I'm like, why do we have two carbapenems? Let's get rid of, I think it was amipenem we got rid of. Um, you know, we had several third generation cephalosporins. We don't have babies. I didn't think we needed to have ceftazidime and cefetaxime, so let's just have ceftaraxone. Things like that were fairly easy to streamline. And it made pharmacy's life easier because it was fewer things to buy and keep track of. Um, then one of the next things I did, and again, this is sort of, we'd have to think around workarounds with micro labs if you have them or don't have them. But another thing that I did after I sort of got the drug list compacted um, was that I started looking at some of the antibiotic susceptibility reports and, you know, urine is the bane of my existence. Um, and I pulled up a bunch of urine cultures and noticed for E. coli and the urine that we were reporting a ridiculous uh, amount of antibiotics, like it was the full report essentially coming out from micro. Um, and this, you know, we got things on here like mirapenem, piperacillin, tazobactam, broad spectrum drugs um, that if people see them, they sometimes sort of go straight to them. So what I had micro do was crunch that list down to things that were more reasonable, more narrow spectrum antibiotics, things that I thought were more appropriate to use for patients' urine, um, and sort of suppress essentially some of those broader spectrum antibiotics or have tiered reporting and report them only if we need them. And then I also noticed that we were using mirapenem like for everything uh, and for urinary tract infections, despite the fact we didn't need to. So I restricted mirapenem. So again, and I'm talking over months and months and months, I slowly did these things. 
So this is just an example of an addendum to my stewardship policy that outlines these are the drugs we're going to resist, uh, resist, restrict. We do resist them. Um, and I, you know, in here it goes through, you know, the hours of the day, who's going to call who, and I can help people think about that. But essentially, you know, the process for restriction and who's allowed to, to approve something. And sort of getting to Alan's question, um, and again, I think talking about antibiotic use metrics and, and measuring antibiotic use uh, is probably beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. Um, but there are different antibiotic use metrics depending on if you have electronic data or if you have purchasing data um, that you can get or with your IT folks or also sometimes calculate and I can help you all with resources for how to calculate some of this. But what I tracked, I have antibiotic use data in what's called days of therapy per thousand patient days. This is the CDC antibiotic use metric. And this is just our mirapenem days of therapy per thousand patient days. Uh, over several years, and where this red arrow is is where I restricted mirapenem. It was already on its way down, but as you can see in all different units, it's dropped precipitously after I've uh, restricted it. And I take this data to pharmacy and therapeutics, to the clinical executive board to say, you know, I'm not just saying I'm going to restrict it and then not doing something. This makes me accountable. I've showed this, and I'm like, we are restricting mirapenem use, and our usage has dropped uh, precipitously. This is um, another look, again, on the x-axis of years, and this is, again, our antibiotic use metric, days of therapy per thousand patient days. And I would just tell you that this metric requires having individual patient um, uh, antibiotic use data because we track it to the patient based on barcode administration uh, and to the unit. Um, but this green may not come through very well here on the bottom is our mirapenem use, and I res you know, started restricting it in 2013. Uh, and it fell, but I started to look at what was happening with our other antibiotics, and I don't know if it comes through, but this yellow here is cephalosporins, and usually if you restrict something, it doesn't mean people aren't going to use antibiotics, they just pick something else to use, uh, and our ceftriaxone use kind of went through the roof. Um, so again, I'm talking over multiple years, so this wasn't quick. Uh, the next thing I did was say, okay, you know, now... I've restricted these antibiotics. I had residents and random people helping me sort of with the restrictions. But now we're going to start doing antibiotic reviews. And I still didn't have a pharmacist. And what I did for this was outline a process, again, for what drugs we're going to review, what days of the week we're going to review them roughly. Um, and I went and talked to pharmacists all over the hospital and sort of gave them a pitch about stewardship and said, is this something you might be interested in? Do you want to help me with this? I will teach you. I'll need you to sort of weed through the list every day by X, Y, and Z criteria and tell me these are the patients that need to be reviewed, and then we'll sit down together and talk about them. And then over time, you can probably start be doing this on your own. And I taught medicine pharmacists, not ID trained physicians, how to review some, again, these very basic things like pneumonia, urinary tract infections, and skin and soft tissue infections. And so, you know, we started reviewing. These are the antibiotics up here that we review. You do not have to do this, but I made a note uh, in our electronic health record to help me with communication, to get buy-in, because my name is stamped in the chart on every one of these patients, and also for tracking so I can pull reports off of these. Uh, but they would leave these notes for me. Again, pharmacists who aren't ID trained, and they were um, doing all this uh, for me, essentially, uh, once I got them uh, excited about it. And what you can see here, again, this is just a different way looking over between 2009 and 2016, our antibiotic use. Uh, and days of therapy for 1,000 patient days. Um, and CDC breaks antibiotics into these different categories, uh, anti-MRSA drugs, which is really vancomycin, but includes daptomycin and linazolid, um, some of the broad-spectrum hospital antibiotics, which is, again, your anti so your anti-pseudomonal beta-lactams, mirapenem, zosin, cefepime, namely, uh, and then some of these broad-spectrum community drugs like fluoroquinolones uh, and cephalosporins. Sorry, this doesn't come through very well, but the yellow lines where I started restricting drugs and then the blue line is where we started reviewing them and giving people recommendations on, okay, you, you used mirapenem for cellulitis. I think you can put that person on um, cefazolin or something. Uh, and our antibiotic use uh, went way down. And I'll tell you, it was a lot of work up front, but again, we're a fairly small hospital, and my pharmacist now spends maybe, I mean, we've even added drugs to the list just because we got control of, we started with just a few drugs, and then we, we started with, like, Vank and Mirapenem. Okay, now we're going to add Cefepime. Now we're going to add Zosin. Now we're going to add Ceftriaxone. Once he started, you know, people started learning how to use things, um, 
he spends maybe an hour or two doing this a day and, and then has time freed up to do other things. <clears throat> so then one other thing, just sort of, again, I've added these things slowly, is that you can review positive blood cultures. Um, and this is just an example. You guys can refer and look at this later. We review positive blood cultures or actually get called from the lab about them. Um, and we just felt like this was a clinically really important thing for us to know if a patient has bacteria in their blood and to help folks uh, get the patient on the right antibiotic and sort of do other ancillary, maybe endocarditis workup or other thing that needs to happen um, fairly quickly. And we tracked this. And, you know, again, I don't, I don't track this ongoing. I tracked it for a two-week period just to say, hey, this needs to be reviewed because there's a lot of things to say <laughs> and recommend about patients on, on, uh, with positive blood cultures on broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, and then again, for a two week period, we tracked our acceptance rate, just again, going back through the charts and pretty much everyone was doing what we said. So, I, you know, I think it's an important thing to be doing and I track this again to, to show folks it's important, um, but also sometimes to leverage more support uh, for the pharmacist, whether it's in time or money, because this takes time to do, to do this work. So this is just, again, the timeline of, of what we've done. Again, I, this has been, <coughs> Now a four-year process, and this was not fast, and that, that's the point I want to make to you all, that we, we started really small, and it was like, okay, we're going to restrict these three drugs, and then we said, okay, what is it? So that was early 2013, and then it wasn't until 2015 that I started doing antibiotic uh, reviews, um, again, so after it had already been prescribed, saying at 48 hours, I'm going to start to review cefepimazos, and I did this very, very slowly, um, and, you know, I... The first thing I did was develop a policy, and then it wasn't again for probably four or five months that I really then started restricting drugs. Um, the blood culture review I actually did in November 2014, and then it was almost you know six months later that we started doing antibiotic reviews. And I didn't hire a pharmacist, and I was able to, because of the work that I had slowly built, get funding from administration, but I didn't hire a pharmacist until a year ago. So I was doing this with the help of um, pharmacists essentially that I was able to, who already existing there that I was able to leverage throughout the hospital. Um, and then, you know, just now that we have a, a pharmacist that we've hired, the sort of next thing we're going to is developing some facility specific treatment guidelines. Um, and again, this is four years after the fact, trying to guide people on how we want them to use antibiotics for urinary tract infections, pneumonia, et cetera. And I just put this here to remind me and to remind you all that I'm happy to share guidelines and pathways and help you guys adapt these. Uh, to your local sort of formulary and antibiotics that you have if you need them. Um, so just thinking real through, I mean, the, a lot of this is probably somewhat overwhelming, but just wanted uh, to tell people, like, how do you think about what action to pick? Well, I think somewhat you have to know, clearly, you have to be aware of what your local resources are and your expertise and what you can and can't do. Um, and I knew that I could restrict drugs and that, that, you know, I sort of trained in a place where we weren't allowed to prescribe antibiotics without talking to somebody. So I did that first. Um, because I saw, one, I knew I could do it. Two, I saw there was broad spectrum use that I thought was completely unnecessary. We, our, our, our susceptibilities did not support using really broad spectrum drugs. So that was the first thing I did was to restrict mirapenem. But I think knowing your local resources and needs, and you may not know off the top of your head, but when you stop and think about it, you guys may know where the problem antibiotic use is or what are the syndromes uh, that you most commonly see, and that's where I would start. Um, and if you don't have data, <clears throat> again, it's sort of beyond the scope of this talk, um, but if you don't have data or don't know, Eddie and I can provide you some resources or some sort of um, roadmaps, I'd say, to how to get some baseline data and try and figure out uh, where some of your problems might be or where you should start. Um, and I'd say, you know, getting baseline data is important because then you can measure after you do some sort of intervention, you can keep track of things as you go forward. One, that's important because technically we're supposed to be doing that per CDC and the Joint Commission, but it creates incredible buy-in to go and show administrators and specifically physicians like, hey, look, we were do using this much mirapenem. I told you I thought we didn't really need to. Now, look, we've restricted it. The use has gone down. But also then I track like length of stay and ICU length of stay and readmission. I can say, grossly, we haven't hurt anybody. Like, you know, I think the clinical outcomes are roughly the same. Um, and I'd say, again, don't overextend yourself. I, I, I did this very, very slowly. Um, and you just don't, I would just, you got to do just one thing at a time and do it for probably six, nine months before you then add on the next thing. And as you're doing that intervention, you'll get a sense, like I did, of what the next step may be over time. 
Um, again, I would refer you to the, the National Quality Forum playbook. Um, and regardless of your size, I think this can be extremely overwhelming, whether it's a big hospital, a little hospital. Uh, and I would caution you, don't get overwhelmed. And a way to not get overwhelmed is make sure you just get everybody at the table first. You real I spent, again, six, nine months just getting people interested um, and getting sort of all my ducks in a row before I actually, quote unquote, started doing stewardship. And then I only picked one intervention. I've only ever done one thing at a time before I've added something else and then figured out how to integrate them. So avoid getting overwhelmed. Uh, I always go to people ahead of time and tell them, hey, I'm going to start reviewing this antibiotic or I'm going to start rounding in the ICU. But I, get, I make it their idea first and get provider buy-in and, and stakeholder buy-in before I do anything. And that makes things so much smoother. Um, and, and education, education. I, I've given numerous uh, uh, talks at the VA and at the U about stewardship just so they know because people don't even know, like, why are you doing this? Why are you reviewing our antibiotics? Um, and have to make them really aware of everything that we're doing so that it s flows very smoothly. So I'm going to stop there. And the, again, hopefully I was able to help you define what stewardship is, appreciate why it's important, um, start to think about who some of the team members, and Eddie's going to get into this more specifically, about sort of large hospitals versus small hospitals and, and, and the differences. But start to think about who your team members might be and some of the first steps you might do at your hospital. Um, and I'd say, you know, you're going to have to be creative. Uh, and you guys are probably far more creative than I am because you've already had to be creative about different things. So, but use the resources that Eddie and I give you. I'd say use us, email us, call us. We're happy to help. Um, and specifically, this should be the beginning of you all mentoring each other and hopefully working to, with each other to, to troubleshoot sort of how to do this in your setting. So I'll stop there and see if there's any questions. As most of you know about Intermountain, we have 16 small hospitals that have less than 150 beds. And when I started, zero of them had any kind of stewardship program. And what we can say now is all 16 have stewardship programs that will meet joint commission. Okay. And so I'm going to kind of take you through our process of what we did. Granted, we're different. We're the, the big healthcare network in Utah. We got a lot of central resources that you all don't have in being the rural nine. Um, and I get that, but I'm going to hopefully show you ways we can get around that and hopefully give you some practical advice. Um, this is a lot of information, okay? And so you feel like you're kind of drinking out of a fire hose. The most important stuff that you're going to hear today is what Emily talked to you about. It's the why, okay? She talked to you about the why we need to do stewardship. And I'm so happy there's an administrator here to hear this and hopefully talk to the other eight rural uh, facilities to, to really get people on board. And the other stuff, the how to do it, we can help you with that. Okay, but you all are the people that are going to do the why part, and you, you got to convince your physicians, your NPs, your PAs, anybody who prescribes antibiotics why it's important. And what Emily showed you is the why. Okay, um, yeah, it's going to be mandatory. That helps. Okay, your cause, but the why part is really critical. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple things. One is the case for stewardship programs in small hospitals, and it's a bit different, and it's a kind of a discussion we need to have. We'll talk about some similarities between small and large hospitals as it comes to stewardship. And then we're going to talk about some possible solutions in terms of the way other people are doing this um, across the country. Um, we're going to skip that. Okay, so in the U.S., 2015, there's about 5,500 hospitals in the United States, both federal and non-federal. Um, and 73 percent of those have less than 200 beds. So that's over 4,000 hospitals in the United States that have less than 200 beds. Um, so the first question you should ask is say, well, how does my antibiotic use compare to the others in those, in those facilities? I'm a small center. I, I don't use a lot of antibiotics, right? Um, and so how does your use compare to large facilities? Well, this is Intermountain data. This is data we just published um, back in October. What you're seeing on the right here are, are four large facilities. So this is Utah Valley, McKD, IMC, and Dixie. And on the left, you see our 15 small community hospitals on the left. This is total facility antibiotic use rate. Okay, so this is days of therapy per 1,000 patient days. I'll get out of your way so you can see that. Um, so this is a rate of antibiotics, so it accounts for the hospital size. Um, and this is a total, totally facility-wide. And so what you can see is that there's incredible variability in a small hospital in terms of antibiotic use. Um, and in many facilities, it's higher than our large facilities. In okay? these little diamonds here, this is our case mix index. So this is a measure of severity. 
Okay? And so what you see in, this, in the large hospitals is that you have a higher case mix index, um, on average a higher antibiotic use in general, but in smaller it's a lower case mix index with um, similar antibiotic use. What we found when we started really getting into the details in these facilities is that in, especially in rural Utah, we haven't compared this to other rural facilities, um, smaller facilities, is that um, in some places 50% to 65% of the bed days in those hospitals are accounted by maternity and labor and delivery in nursing or nurseries. And those units don't use antibiotics all that frequently. Okay? And so we pulled all of that out. Of our, of our calculation. So we got rid of the mom-baby units, got rid of the nursery units, and we did that for both our small hospitals up here and our large hospitals down here, which had a smaller rate of those particular bed days, and we regraphed it. And what you're now seeing is that a lot of these small hospitals, when you account and get rid of those low utilizers, these small hospitals look exactly like large hospitals when it looks at antimicrobial usage rates. Okay. And this has been shown on multiple studies now, one nationally through the CDC, that the antibiotic use rates in small hospitals is the same as large. Okay? You just use less of them because you have fewer patients, right? But the rate is the same. My hypothesis was, well, maybe, maybe we don't use the same antibiotics. Maybe you're using narrower spectrum antibiotics. And so we categorize antibiotics, and this isn't for you to really digest, but just know category four and five the way we categorize these, these are broad spectrum agents. These are agents that you treat resistant gram negatives, resistant gram positives. And when we looked at what proportion of use is in those broad spectrum categories, it's the same, okay, large versus small. The bottom here is the big category four or five, big gun antibiotics, same thing over in the large. And so what I want you to see is that you may have not measured your usage rates, okay, because that's pretty challenging to do in small hospitals, but I guarantee it's pretty similar to large, okay. Um, unless you've had an established stewardship program. Okay, so what we can say is small hospitals have similar antibiotic usage rates. Okay, we can feel comfortable saying that, not just Intermountain data, but national data. So how many stewardship programs, or small hospitals have stewardship programs? I just showed you 4,000 hospitals in the U.S. have less than 200 beds. So these are data from the CDC. I'm actually going to show you the most recent, 2015. This was a point prevalence survey using NHSN data, how we all report our HAIs to the CDC. And they went and said, how many hospitals meet all seven core elements of the CDC core elements? Okay. And what you can see is that if you have zero to 50 beds, only 31% of those hospitals had stewardship programs that did that. 51 to 200 beds, 49%. Here's critical access hospitals. 26% of hospitals that were critical access status had a stewardship program that met CDC's core elements. Okay. So there's 4,000 hospitals that have less than 200 beds. You multiply that by these, we're talking over 2,000 hospitals that have to establish stewardship programs in anticipation of, um, of regulation. So we've, we've got a ways to go. And so I applaud you for being here. You're on the cusp of moving forward. Um, and most states aren't there. Okay, and so you're, you're well ahead of the game. Um, so I'd say most hospitals that are small don't have stewardship programs, and vast majority don't have ID clinicians. You guys don't have an ID doc that comes to your hospital. You don't have an ID pharmacist, and you're not going to get one. I'm sorry. There's, just, there's not enough work to hire an ID physician, let alone enough doctors to do that. So what about regulations? I'm going to quick through, go through this. Emily already talked about it. Um, Joint Commission has well-established now regulations. Are any of you Joint Commission accredited? I wouldn't think as a critical access hospital you would. Okay. So CMS regulations um, were moving. They, they had the language done. They were going through the right people. The public comment period had ended. They'd gone and responded to it, and then the election happened. Um, and because of the election happened, this was bundled with a number of other conditions of participation um, that caused this to get stalled out. Okay? And so to be completely frank with you, we don't know where this is. When we talk to the CMS medical director, when we talk to the CDC, this is coming. Okay? In what form this comes, we don't know. Okay? But most likely this is going to be pulled back out, go back to public comment, and then back into as a condition of participation by itself. But we haven't had a lot of word from the administration in terms of how supportive they are in terms of multidrug resistant organisms, period. Okay? But it's coming. And like Emily said, it's probably a year or two out, realistically. Um, they tried to push this through before the administration came, before the election happened, and it didn't happen. Okay? But it's going to be there. Um, 
so what's the evidence base of stewardship? <laughs> okay, 4,000 hospitals have to have stewardship programs that are less than 200 beds. Over 50% don't have them. Um, what is our evidence base to do this? Um, well, it's right here. It's, it's three review articles, okay? And this is based on, uh, on five studies, okay? There is no evidence base on how to do stewardship in small hospitals. We're making this up as we go, okay? Um, the best review article is right here. This one's hot. This one's right off the press. This is the one that you want to go to because it's, it's, it's the best. Not biased at all. Um, no, honestly, this is a review article we did that just came out online a couple weeks ago um, about our experience within Intermountain, the Kaiser experience, the HCA experience, working with the CDC and Pew Charitable Trust. And a lot of what I'm talking about today is in this document. Um, like I said, this is based on five studies. Um, the five studies are listed there. Uh, a sixth study just came out today in small hospitals. Um, all these studies show a positive experience. Okay, they all show that antibiotic stewardship in small hospitals work. All of these studies had an ID physician involved, and all of them had dedicated pharmacy time. Not ID pharmacy, but pharmacy time. Um, there's other places that have done this successfully. Okay? They just haven't published their work. I think the reason these are published is because they were all done by ID docs. Okay? And so an ID physician said, this is novel, I'm going to write about it. But you know, I talk all over the U.S. about this, and there's places that are doing this. There's hospitals in Idaho, there's places all over that are doing this with a nurse lead, with an infection prevention lead, with a pharmacy lead. Um, we're just not writing about it. We're not capturing that. Okay, so it's there and it's been successful, but we just, it's not in the literature. Um, so I want to kind of take you through, in terms of what Intermountain has done, in terms of kind of getting over this hurdle of lack of, um, of data. And so these are the Intermountain hospitals, as you can see here, starting with Intermountain Medical Center. That's the largest, down to Fillmore on the bottom, which is the smallest. This was 2014 um, when we started looking at this, and we realized that 25% of Intermountain's bed days are in small hospitals. Okay? Of those 15 hospitals, none of them had stewardship programs, and one had a part-time ID support that would come intermittently. That was at American Fork. Okay? Compare that to our, our large hospitals up here. All of them had stewardship programs in varying degrees and varying methods. We all had access to ID clinicians. We could get an ID consult on a Sunday night if you wanted one. Okay, so a huge difference, right? And we started to learn that the antibiotic use rates are the same. Okay, and so that's when we started saying we need to, to really focus on these small hospitals. Um, and that's where the SCORE study was born out of. So all these slides are labeled with SCORE. This was a study that we got funded from the Joint Commission and Pfizer to study how to do stewardship programs in small hospitals. That was our question, is how to define a stewardship strategy for our smaller hospitals that optimizes outcomes, like Emily was saying, this is about outcomes, but maximizing our resources. We knew we weren't gonna put an ID clinician in Delta or Fillmore, okay? So how are we gonna do this? We designed a cluster randomized trial. I designed three different stewardship program types that I'm gonna show you and talk about, and we randomized each hospital into one of these program types. And it was a 15-month intervention. So this is, are, are three different program types. And so each hospital, we had 15 hospitals, got randomized into one of those three arms, okay? All of them got basic stewardship education, kind of in the form like this. We gave them some material on what is stewardship, some basics about how to, some IV to PO conversion, some antibiotic indication, some real basic stuff. We also gave them their data. We gave them monthly, here's your antibiotic usage data. We didn't compare it to anybody, so we just said, here's yours and it's on a month by month, they can see what they've done over time. We, they all had access to an ID clinician through an infectious disease hotline. They could dial 801-50-SCORE and it would directly go to my cell phone. If they had a question, we could talk about it. I didn't think that that was gonna be very popular. And that's why we did that. Um, <laughs> I was really wrong. Um, so program one, <laughs> that's all they had. That's it, bare bones, there wasn't a committee, here's some education, here's your data, here's an access to an ID doc, Good luck, okay. Program two and three, we did some more in-depth pharmacy stewardship education. We went and did a, a full day workshop with them. We really walked through how to do stewardship, what it meant to do restrictions and prospective audit and feedback. And then in program two, we had the pharmacist review anybody on a broad spectrum agent. So if you're on cefepime, meropenem, vancomycin, or dapto, that patient was reviewed by the pharmacist and looked for times where you could de-escalate antibiotics. Okay, so we made it, we put it into their workflow. We also developed restrictions. We said you can't use meropenem, imipenem, daptomycin, linazolid, voriconazole, whole list of things. 
because it didn't match the microbiology. They didn't need to use that drug. So we worked with the micro folks and said, let's see the antibiogram, and said, you don't need these drugs. And so we said it's restricted. But in program two, the local pharmacy staff did the restricting. ID didn't do the restricting. It was the local pharmacy staff. We really wanted to see how well this worked because the relationships in small hospitals is different than the relationship in large hospitals. And so is that pharmacist comfortable telling that doctor no? Okay. Now in program three, we did the education. The pharmacist reviewed more drugs. Went down to ceftriaxone, fluoroquinolones, those types of things. Um, we held control over the restriction. So if you wanted meropenem, you had to call our ID pharmacist and that person could dispense the drug. And then I reviewed all positive blood cultures, all positive cultures for multidrug resistant organisms, all cases of C. diff, all cases of meningitis, and I called the provider and talked to them about potential management strategies. So what I'm gonna show you is our primary analysis is change in antibiotic use. And we're gonna talk about measurement shortly, but the change in antibiotic use is something called days of therapy per 1,000 patient days. And so if I give Rosemary two antibiotics for two days, if I gave her Vank and Marrow for two days, that's four days of therapy, okay? If I give Janet one antibiotic, let's say Clinda, clindamycin, for five days, that's five days of therapy. Regardless of dose, regardless of duration, or pardon me, regardless of dose or interval, Q6, Q8, if you got any bit of that antibiotic, that's one day of therapy. The denominator was 1,000 patient days, a kind of a common denominator. We looked at other secondary stuff, mortality, 30-day readmission, C. diff, all those other things. So this is a confusing slide but I'm going to walk you through it. So on the left is all antibiotics. So that's taken all antibiotics from those units. On the right are the broad spectrum agents, those category four, five drugs, those really broad spectrum MDRO active. What you see in the top panel is program one. You see the five hospitals, one, two, three, four, five, that were in that hospital, or pardon me, in that program type, and their summary measure below it. And then in Program two, this middle one, you see the five hospitals, a summary measure, and in program three, five hospitals, a summary measure. So what you're looking at is a rate ratio. So we're looking at the rate of antibiotics during the intervention, compared it to the baseline. So if your rate ratio is less than one, you reduced antibiotics, okay? That was our primary analysis. So if you look in the top panel, program one, if you look at this summary measure right there on one, we didn't do anything in program one. Literally, we did nothing in terms of antibiotic usage. And you see none of the hospitals improve usage by having an arrow to the left. We actually had one that increased usage by 25%. We felt really good about that, yeah. Program two is when we started really kind of up in the ante, teaching them how to do some things. And we thought, if we're gonna have some good reductions. We hypothesized a 10% reduction. And we didn't get that. Um, you see program two, all antibiotics right there on one. We didn't do anything. In program two, we're starting to get a hint that we're moving to the left on the broad spectrum agents, and what you're seeing is this incredible variability. You see a hospital here, two hospitals that reduce antibiotics, but two hospitals increase antibiotics, okay? Kind of same thing over there on the broad spectrum antibiotics. So this kind of came up with our saying is that if you see one small hospital, you've seen one small hospital. They're all different, and they all take to these things differently, and the culture in each facility is different, and the dynamics between physician and pharmacist and nursing is all different, and so this is what you all have to struggle with. Now in program three, where we got infectious disease involved, I called, we talked to a lot of them. What we see is we reduced total antibiotic use about by 15%. Broad spectrum antibiotic use, we reduced by 25%. In those facilities where ID was involved a little more heavily, the pharmacists were engaged, we had more kind of back and forth. And in, I wanna draw attention to Hospital 11. That's um, Kaja Regional Medical Center up in Burley, Idaho. Um, critical access hospital, I believe. Um, they reduced their broad spectrum usage by about 40%. They reduced their restricted drugs by 75%, okay? And this didn't take a ton of work, but it took engagement with the pharmacists and the clinicians, okay? And you can see that. I mean, you see other hospitals here, 30% reduction. Uh, total usage, 20% reduction. Um, and so we saw these incredible shifts in these hospitals that were really engaged, but used ID physicians and pharmacists and, and called us. This is the ID hotline. This was the hotline that I didn't think was gonna get used until we started it. Um, and we took 1,006 phone calls over 15 months, okay? People called this, this hotline, and what we learned is that there's really sick patients in your hospitals, okay? It's incredible what we saw day to day in your hospitals, okay? You had really sick patients that wanted to stay in their community. 
Um, and we tried to help as much as we could without transferring the patient. And many times we had to. We said, I got to see him. Okay, you got to send him down. They need a surgeon, whatever it might be. Um, but we took a lot of calls. And what was interesting is Program 1 hospitals, they never called. <laughs> I had about 25 calls from those five hospitals that were in Program 1. That's it. So when you look at the rate, they're down here at the bottom. If you look at Program 2 and Program 3 that had stewardship programs, they're the ones that called and called often. So this is really 1,000 calls within 10 hospitals. Okay? Um, and so it showed that engagement by, by stewardship, and then people were actually thinking about these things. So what we concluded from this is that higher level stewardship programs resulted in a reduction in antibiotic use in our small hospitals. Um, more stewardship support was associated with more ID telephone support, those program two and three facilities. And that stewardship programs are feasible, small hospitals. You can do this. You can impact change in your facilities. It's just a matter of making this, um, uh, this commitment. So this is just kind of a summary of the scope, is that your antibiotic usage rates is the same as mine at your Mountain Medical Center most likely. You probably don't have a stewardship program or you're developing one, that's why you're here. You don't have a whole lot of studies to back this up, okay? But you're all gonna have to have it, okay? And you all need to have it because of all the things that Emily said about resistance and the fact that drug resistance is something that we all share, okay? This isn't a hypothetical thing. This is what impacts us, not our hospitals. It impacts literally us, okay? So, um, you know, when, before I was finishing my residency, I actually had an intra-abdominal abscess due to multidrug resistant organism. I had to be on a pick line okay, for three weeks of IV antibiotics. I didn't, it wasn't an oral drug available to treat me. I'd like to say that was the reason I went into ID, but that wasn't the case at all. It just happened to be that. <laughs> but it's not just it's going to affect our patient. It affects us, and it affects the rural communities as much as it affects the, the larger hospitals in Salt Lake. Um, so I'm going to kind of take you through kind of what we've learned. This is Intermountain Medical Center, our flagship facility. We're growing, building building new buildings. And then down here, this is um, a small little hospital up in Tree Mountain. And how do we take what we've learned from Intermount Medical Center down to these small hospitals? And how do we bring that to you all that are not part of our network? Um, so we're going to go through some sim similarities and differences. I'm going to tell you right now, these are gross generalizations. I apologize, but they are. Um, things are probably maybe different at your facility, but this is what we've learned over the past um, three, four years. We're going to talk about constructing a team, patients and infections, drug resistance, and lab, and it'd be interesting to hear from the micro folks. Data collection to get at what Alan was talking about and to get in some of the cost issues because the cost kind of discussion is very different in a small hospital compared to a large hospital. Okay, so when you're constructing a team, those things are, those lists are the same essentially except the bottom one is that a local leader is essential. Um, you need to have a multidisciplinary team is that engagement is critical and it's often very challenging. Um, staff capacity is limited, whether it's small or large. In small, it's usually the same 10 people that are doing everything. Um, in large, you just have more of them, but they're all still really busy. Um, ID physicians are rare and small versus they're really pretty common and large. Okay, that's the, the big difference. So um, what can you do? So if possible, you can designate a physician, okay? That doesn't come easy. And so in our 16, uh, facilities that now have sewership program, we've required it, that they have to have a physician leader. We're a little different that we can do that. They're all salaried docs. We can make that happen, okay? But that's probably not going to be the case in your facility, okay? But if you have a physician that is interested in them, in this, engage them. Bring them to the table and make it easy for them, okay? They're busy, just like we are, but if you can engage them, great, okay? But that's really challenging. We don't see that very often to have a really engaged physician unless Jeff incentivizes it. Unless Jeff says, I'm going to pay part of your salary. Okay. But if you don't, it's going to be a really tough sell. So what do you do? What we see most often is the pharmacist leads this. Okay. Typically, it's the pharmacist that leads this. And this is where we see most of this action coming from. I haven't really seen a pharmacy tech lead it. I'd be really interested in that. But typically, in smaller facilities, it's the pharmacist. Um, and not all of you may have a pharmacist, so this may not be the most kind of practical approach, but just saying this is where most of it comes. Um, try to integrate your stewardship efforts into other quality improvement efforts. So if you're having a, a sepsis intervention, make that a stewardship sepsis intervention. If you have other interventions that happen to relate to infections, you can turn that into stewardship. Okay, so try to integrate multiple things under a stewardship umbrella. 
They combine stewardship meetings into other standing committees. Nobody wants to go to another meeting. Okay? But if you can take stewardship and put it into P&T, if you can take stewardship and put it under MEC, does anybody have a medical executive council of some sort? Okay. We've seen people say, okay, we're going to take the first 15 minutes of our MEC meeting, and this is the stewardship meeting. Okay, and we're going to review data and review our actions. Move it into P&T. Maybe you have a little different leadership structure, but if you can make it so it's not a separate meeting, you're going to get more engagement. People are going to show up, especially if you give them food. Um, engage administration early. This is so critical, and this is the part of the job of the why, is that if you can, under, if you can get in administration to understand why we need to do this in terms of drug resistance and safety and outcomes and all of those things, it goes a lot easier okay? because they can make these things happen. So engage them early on. Get trained. There's lots of resources that we can talk about, especially if you're the pharmacist. You don't need to go to ID fellowship. You don't need to be an ID pharmacist to do this. Okay? There's lots of resources out there to get trained and make yourself an expert. We're going to talk about really the three areas to make yourself an expert in. Um, evaluate teleservices or other hospital collaboratives if needed. Um, Colorado has a state-based ho hospital collaboration. Look at other teleservices if that's the way you want to go. And we're going to talk about different options but evaluate those sources. If possible, ID clinicians should be actively involved. You saw from our data that if you involved ID clinicians, you mo we moved the needle, okay? I'm not saying it's gonna be practical in everybody's position, but if you can, and think creative ways to do this, I would involve them, okay? So patients and infections. So this one's pretty straightforward. Small hospitals have really sick patients, okay? Period, there's plenty of calls I took about really old people with infected joints, with bad hearts and end-stage renal disease. But in general, small hospitals versus large hospitals, small hospitals have less complex patients because in critical access hospitals, if you get one, you need to ship them out, a 48-hour rule, all those things. Okay, so in general, they're less complex, and you see more of pneumonia, UTI, and skin infection. That's what those three abbreviations. Community acquired pneumonia, UTI, and acute bacterial skin and skin structure infections. That's what those three are. If you can focus on those three, most of your work is going to be done. Okay, so if you can be an expert, I'm looking at the pharmacists in the room, the IPs in the room, if you can be an expert in community acquired pneumonia, UTI pilo, and skin infections, if, and if you do, sir, does anybody operate? Does any, is there any ORs? Okay, and if you can throw in um, antibiotic prophylaxis for surgery, you're going to cover about 70% of your prescribing. Okay, so don't try to get hung up too much on the details, but if you can focus on those core syndromes, you're going to cover the majority of the patients that you see in your facilities when it comes to antibiotic prescribing. Okay, so that's the part where I just want to say, simplify this, focus on those syndromes. Um, and like Emily said, it generally takes less time to review patients. When we talk to our facilities and you ask them, they're now up and running, this is kind of routine, how much time do you spend per day? It's maybe 20 minutes. Okay, so if you're a critical access hospital, if you have 25 beds, and you, maybe you're running at 50% occupancy, 40, whatever, 60 it might be, you're maybe down to 12 patients in your hospital. And if you look at national data, 50% of them are going to be on antibiotics. So now you're down to six patients. And if you look at those six patients, most of them are going to fit into that. So once you get comfortable with pneumonia, UTI, and skin infection, and you develop your algorithms for that, you can breeze through those six patients to make sure that the care is appropriate pretty quickly. But it's an investment up front to say, what do I need to do to get there? Okay. So if you can focus on those. Um, make care process models algorithms for the core infections. Can't emphasize that enough. Emily hinted or talked about her UTI algorithm. This is where you need to spend your time. Okay. It's looking at your micro, talking to me, talking to Emily. What do our algorithms look like? Copying them. I don't care. But get algorithms for your facilities for these three things because not only does it kind of streamline and take out variation in care, you can also measure against this, which we're going to talk about. Okay, drug resistance and lab limitations. Does anybody have an on site micro lab? You all do. Does anybody else? Everybody else sends their stuff out, I'm assuming? Okay. Um, so in small hospitals compared to large, generally in small hospitals, you have decreased resistance. Okay, that was the whole point when we restricted drugs is that they very rarely saw pseudomonas or extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing E. coli's. They didn't need to use meropenem for that. They don't see vancomycin resistant enterococcus. Okay? So if you don't see those organisms, you don't need those drugs that target those. And so understand what your resistance looks like. 
Many of these, the smaller facilities have off-site micro labs, so you're dealing with longer turnaround times. You have people with, you generally don't have rapid diagnostic tests, which really emphasizes the fact that you need to be, have good empiric regiments up front that aren't really broad, because it's really easy to start something broad, and then the physicians say, listen, they're getting better. I don't want to change anything until the cultures are back, and you're talking 48, 72 hours later, and then they're negative, and what do you do? Okay, so really critical. Um, when you're developing antibiograms, you don't have a lot of isolates to get a whole lot of data. Um, and so that's a big limitation to understand for your clinicians. What's their resistance look like? It's hard for them to know. You know if they see one case of a drug resistance and they're just going to anchor on that, then you've changed their prescribing pattern. And so how do you get that data? And could you work regionally? You know, can you work with AROP? Can you work with LabCorp, whoever you send your micro to, to pull out an antibiogram? Okay. Can the nine of you potentially work together to develop a rural nine antibiogram? It's hard for each individual hospital to do it, right, in terms of numbers. But I bet if you all put your antibiograms together, you now have got isolates where you can actually make some, um, some recommendations. It's something to think about. Um, less rapid diagnostics tests we talk about. So um, kind of some key points in this. If you can develop an antibiogram, and I know this is easier said than done, but this takes a discussion with ARUP, a discussion with LabCorp, whoever it is, wherever you send out your micro, can you talk to them and get an antibiogram? Okay, and it's, it's challenging to do. And you don't need an antibiogram for all the isolates that you see, okay? Say, hey, what's our four most common organisms? Let's get our antibiogram for E. coli, Staph aureus, Enterococcus, and Klebsiella, for example. Okay, make this easier. Look at your foremost common and get an antibiogram for those. Um, develop a rural nine antibiogram. Did I plant that seed at all? Something to think about. Um, and then I would say know the prevalence of these organisms right here. So if you're going to write something down, write down those four organisms right there. MRSA, know the prevalence, the incidence of MRSA. That's going to help you be able to give recommendations on vancomycin, empiric vancomycin use. Okay? What we can say is that MRSA rates are decreasing in the state of Utah. But what we can't say is that vancomycin use is decreasing in the state of Utah, okay? So know your rate of MRSA. Vancomycin resistant enterococci, so VRE, know your rate or non-existent rate of that. Daptomycin can break budgets, 500 bucks a day for daptomycin. You don't typically need to use it um, in general. Granted, sometimes you need to, but typically you don't. ESBL, extended spectrum beta lactamase producing enterobacteriaceae. So these are E. coli isolates and Klebsiella isolates that at the bottom will say this is an ESBL producer and that you typically use carbapenems for. Okay, so meropenem, ertapenem, imipenem. Um, if you know the rate of this, then you can easily say, hey, we don't need to use these carbapenems routinely, just like Emily did at the VA, just like we did in our small hospitals. And then the last one is pseudomonas and know your fluoroquinolone susceptibility for pseudomonas. A lot of people say, I gotta use Zosin because I'm worried about pseudomonas. If you've had two cases of pseudomonas infections at your hospital, you don't routinely need to use that drug or Zosin or Cefepime, you can use Ceftriaxone. You can use Ceftriaxone and Metronidazole. So know those key organisms because that's gonna impact your prescribing, okay? Does that make sense? I didn't mean to get too micro-technical, okay. Um, so once you have an antibiogram, are there drugs you don't need to use? So if you look at an antibiogram and you say, okay, my ESBL rate's low, my pseudomonas rate's is low, but I use Zosin all the time, there's a disconnect there. Okay, so are there drugs you can potentially peel off your antibiogram or make restricted based on your microdata? Um, develop restriction policies if you can. Obtain appropriate cultures. This gets to the point of the micro. If you're gonna have small numbers of isolates in your antibiogram, you want to make sure that those pathogens and those organisms are legitimate infections. You don't want skin swabs messing up your antibiogram. Okay, so if there's wound cultures, get deep wound cultures. Okay, um, so get appropriate cultures. And empiric therapy needs to be appropriate following your guidelines that you develop for pneumonia, UTI, and skin infections. Okay, so here comes data collection and analysis, and this one's really kind of challenging. Um, so in small and large, there's an uncertainness of what to measure. Okay, I think what um, Emily and I are, work a lot with the national standpoint in terms of antibiotic prescribing quality metrics, and there's a lot of confusion of what to measure and what measurement truly means. So that is not different from small versus large. Um, in small, there's typically lack of access to data. You just heard Bruce talking about how do you get the E. coli isolates, right? In large hospitals, we have sophisticated IT departments. 
we've got some cool whiz-bang tools at Intermountain to show you these neat dashboards and antibiotic prescribing, um, but that's because we have centralized IT resources and we can pay them. Um, you have lack of infectious disease to interpret data in small hospitals typically, okay, to say, hey, your resistance profile, your antibiotic prescribing doesn't match, maybe do this. Okay, that's not really set up well. And in large, we have structured ID stewardship staff to interpret the data. Okay? So you're really at a disadvantage when it comes to this. Okay? And so um, here are my kind of four bullet points. If you can obtain consumption data in a consistent measure manner, do that. So a consumption measure is just how much antibiotic do you use. Okay? So if you can obtain that, that should be priority number one. So there's pharmacy folks. Can, do you guys know off the top of your head, can you get your monthly antibiotic dispensing data per drug? Does anybody know? I see some nods. If you can get your monthly antibiotic prescribing per drug, you can calculate a consumption metric easily. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay? And it doesn't take fancy tools to do that, but it takes some work on the pharmacy's effort. Okay? So I would say that's number one, is if you can measure a consumption measure, do it. Do it consistently in a consistent manner. And we're going to talk about DOT versus defined daily dose. Um, this doesn't really apply to you, but when I went and talked to Idaho, it did. So um, if you're in part of a healthcare network, utilize them. Um, but you all are here because you're not. Right? OK. Um, chart reviews are often easier at small hospitals than large. And so I said develop a care process model for UTI, pneumonia, and skin infection. And then review those charts. So every month, take 25 patients that fall into one of those categories and review whether or not the antibiotic prescribing was consistent with the guideline you developed. Okay? And then write it down and measure that and say, this month in UTIs, we had 9 to 10 cases that were concordant. That's measurement. It's measurement as long as you report it out to your providers at MEC or P&T or whatever. Okay? So if you develop a care process model, you can then actually measure against the people actually using it. Okay, and that's a really impactful because what you're getting at is appropriateness, not just consumption. Um, and then the last one is measure something. Okay, like Alan said, um, if you can't measure it, you can't change it. Um, kind of a traditional epi principle. Um, so measure something. So two slides on days of therapy versus defined daily doses because you're going to read through all these different online tutorials and you know, looking at the National Quality Forum, they're going to talk about defined daily doses and days of therapy. So I thought it'd be good just to briefly touch on this. So we, we've already mentioned this a little bit, but this is just for reinforcement. Defined, pardon me, days of therapy, this is the now the U.S. standard metric. Okay, this is what most stewardship programs are aiming to measure, and this is days of therapy. So this is any amount of an antibiotic doesn't matter what type of interval, Q12, Q6. If you saw any amount of that antibiotic in a 24-hour period, that's a day of therapy. So if you got five antibiotics in one day, that's five days of therapy. Okay? The problem with days of therapy is it's hard to measure, um, and you typically need pretty sophisticated IT resources to do it automatically. You can calculate this manually, but it would take one of you going every day at pick a time, noon, and seeing if every, any patient is on a drug, and then saying that's one day of therapy for that drug, that's one day of therapy for that drug, that's two days, whatever. It's a very manual process. Otherwise, you have to get an IT group to pull this for you, and it's really challenging. Okay? Very good measure, national measure, but really challenging from a small hospital standpoint. The CDC is going to come out in the next couple months with a document of antibiotic stewardship in small hospitals that we've been putting together for the past couple months. And in that document, it's going to say that days of therapy is what you should be measuring. Okay? I can tell you right now that that's really, really challenging. Okay? The CDC is also the one that has this national measure set up in the NHSN AU data. Okay? So it would be great if all of you could submit data to that, but it's just not realistic. A lot of these hospitals also are connected with long-term care mm -hmm. or swing beds. Yep. How would you recommend that that be yeah. incorporated into this? I would separate the two of them. You can do days of therapy per 1,000 patient days in a long-term care facility, absolutely, because you can get patient days as an administrative measure. Um, so you certainly can do that. And so these apply both. But I would pull out long-term care when you're looking at your data and don't lump them all together. And that's sometimes hard to do because you'll have beds 
in one unit that you're just designating as long-term care. Okay, so it depends on how you pull your data. It really gets at that point. And if you can't, just lump them together and know that. And the issue you rise with that is that it's hard to compare yourself to others if you're throwing in long-term care beds into your general med surge mix. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so define daily doses. This is the one that most small hospitals use, and I showed you those five studies of stewardship in small hospitals. They, three out of the five, use defined daily doses. So what a defined daily dose is, the WHO has defined what is the daily dose for each antibiotic, and they base this on a 70 kilo patient. And so the defined daily dose that WHO has come up with ceftriaxone is two grams. For cefazolin, it's three grams. Daptomycin is 0.280 grams. Meropenem is two grams. That's what the WHO says. This is the typical dose given for one day for that drug. Okay? So then what you can do is you can turn that into a rate by taking your monthly antibiotic prescribing volume to say, hey, we prescribed 15 or whatever, four grams of vancomycin during that month. And you divide it by the defined daily dose and you get the defined daily dose per 1,000 patient days, okay? So this is a, a much more practical rate that you can use in a smaller facility because you can do it at a monthly level and you can pick out the drugs you want to measure. And so if you want to measure Vanc, Zosin, Fluoroquinolone, Ceftriaxone, maybe your carbapenems, um, you know, those are five drugs. And you can calculate your defined daily dose and you can measure that monthly going forward. Okay, and so that's a tool you can certainly use. Um, and maybe if all rural nine hospitals did that, you could all compare yourselves to one another. You know, if you defined, say, hey, this is how we're going to measure antibiotic prescribing. We're going to look at administered doses, not purchased doses, but administered doses. These are the defined daily doses per WHO, and you could set up a standard that you can all share, um, and you can all learn from each other. Um, so data collection and analysis, um, if you can monitor adherence to facility of specific treatment recs, this has come up multiple times. So if you can monitor that adherence, it'd be great. Um, another option is um, we didn't talk about antibiotic timeouts, but um, there's a big push nationally for an antibiotic timeout. Say at 48 hours of antibiotic administration, you, the doc, the pharmacist, the IP says, hey, prescriber, let's hold off a second. Let's review this and make sure that their antibiotics are required. That's a timeout. It takes no intellectual capacity on your standpoint. All you're saying to that provider is like, hey, take a second and think about this. Do we still need antibiotics? Let's review the cultures. Okay, that's an antibiotic timeout. And you can measure whether or not you do that. Okay, that's measurement. Um, perform medication use evaluations for selected antibiotics. This was getting to the point what Emily was talking about. If you think your Zosin is overused, look at 30 patients that got Zosin evaluate that medication use, look at the indications for that drug and determine whether or not it was appropriate or not. And then report that data back to your MEC or your PNT. And say, hey, I reviewed the last 30 doses of, of Zosin in the last 30 patients that received it. 5% of them were appropriate. You know, I'm just making up numbers. But that's powerful data. Okay, and that's something you can do um, at your facility. So cost. Um, this is harder in small hospitals and easier in some regards. In small hospitals, stewardship requires administrative support. The same in small and large. You've got to have your administration on board. Okay? They make this so much easier if they can be supportive of it. Okay? Um, here's the kicker is that um, in large hospitals like Intermountain Medical Center, I need about two to three full FTE equivalents to do stewardship for our 500 bed hospitals with a solid organ transplant, six ICUs, a NICU. I need a lot of people, okay? So I'm going to them asking them for salaries for three people and typically well-trained pharmacists and physicians. You all, you don't need a full per person to do this. That's not enough time, okay? But you need dedicated time to do this. So you need to be able to go to your administration and say, I need four hours a week dedicated to stewardship. You're not asking for a full position, but you can't just add this on. Okay, if you just add this on to the stuff you already do, it's not going to be sustainable. Okay, so you need to make a plan of whose job is this, who's leading it, what kind of time do they actually get to do it. And if you're asking them to do this, what aren't they doing, and where are you going to put that? 
And that's the whole issue in smaller facilities, right, is how do you move that stuff around? But unless you have dedicated time for it, what we see is just it doesn't become sustainable. And when then that person leaves, your program falls apart. Okay? So it's really important to think about how do I get that time, not a full salaried person, but four hours or whatever it might be. The business case is also challenging. Many times in large hospitals, um, we talk about a reduction in length of stay as being a really driver for the, the financial impact of this. Because if we get somebody out sooner, we can put somebody in that bed, and hopefully that person in that bed is a paying customer. Okay? In small hospitals, when your occupancy rate isn't what it is in large facilities, that kind of breaks down. Right? You can't use that same argument. You have a different payment structure when it comes to Medicare and Medicaid than larger facilities do. And so the cost bit gets a little challenging um, in smaller facilities. But what I can also say is that you're going to have to from a regulatory standpoint. Okay, so we're going to have to figure out a way that you're going to make this work in your facility. Um, okay, so this is the, my three options. This is, the, okay, great, now what? Thanks, this was really interesting, but what do I actually do? Okay, and so I'm, I'm giving you three options. This is the, the just do it approach. There's the mentorship approach, and then there's the full-on outsourcing. I don't want to worry about this. Let somebody else do it, okay? So the just do it approach means you guys figure it out, okay? You don't get an ID clinician. You don't get an ID pharmacist. And what you do is you look at the multiple toolkits available. You call Emily and I when you need to. You get trained through Coursera, which is a massive online course, um, SIDP, which is a pharmacy group, Mad ID. you look at review articles, you look at the review articles that I just showed you, and you figure it out. Okay, that's the just do it approach. And this is what the majority of hospitals are probably doing across the country when they're trying to figure this out. So this is an example program for the just do it approach. Um, you get leadership committee, or committed, you get them to sign a letter, and you get them to stand behind it, and you get them to dedicate X amount of time for ideally a pharmacist. You put the ASP part of the P&T committee. That's the most common place that this fits in for Intermountain is through a P&T committee um, because of the antibiotic approvals and restrictions and such. Um, the pharmacy that's designated goes and gets trained by Coursera. This is a massive online course that has multiple free trainings for stewardship. It's done by Stanford. They've done a really nice job um, in developing that. And you can go on. It's about 14 to 20 hours, depending on what you pick, and you get trained. Okay. Um, you try to engage a physician champion, and I say try, but you do your best, and that could be a PCP that admits patients, or it can be a family practice doc, or it could be a hospitalist, or it could be a PA. Ideally, somebody who's influential in the prescribing practice of your hospital, and somebody that people look up to. Okay? What's nice about small hospitals is if you engage the right physicians, and sometimes it only takes engaging one or two, you can dramatically change your antibiotic prescribing. And we've seen this. The reason we've had big reductions in some facilities is that we were able to engage four out of the six physicians, and they all bought into this, and they changed their antibiotic prescribing. It's a heck of a lot easier than what Emily and I are trying to convince transplant surgeons to do. Um, so it, you're, you stand at a bit of an advantage to see that needle move a little bit more. Um, you develop guidelines for CAP and UTI. Okay? So you look at national guidelines. There's good ones for CAP. There's decent ones for UTI. UTI is being revised and coming back out but you make some guidelines for yourself and say, for patients coming in with community-acquired pneumonia, we're going to give them azithrocephtraxone, and we're not going to give them fluoroquinolones. Healthcare-associated pneumonia is dead. We're going to use CAP guidelines. Okay? That's it. And you make those recommendations. UTI, you say, if somebody comes in with UTI and they're not septic, they get ceftraxone. If they're septic and you review your micro and equalize sensitive ceftraxone, everybody gets ceftraxone. If they have a, an allergy, you say, this is a designated penicillin allergy drug. Okay, so make two guidelines and measure compliance if you can. And then every patient on Zosin, Cefepime, Carbapenems are reviewed. Okay, so that's your job as a day-to-day -day pharmacy to make sure that they're concordant with your guideline you made. And anybody who gets prescribed any of those three drugs, you review them, you talk to the physician to see if there's any way you can de-escalate. Okay, and then you measure defined daily dose and report it to monthly staff meetings along with intermittent education. Okay, that'll check the box for educating uh, prescribers intermittently. Um, and so that's just an example program of what you could do. Don't do it all at once. You know? Start with this part. Start developing a committee. And then add on to those things sequentially. But that is you know, what you could do in terms of a just do it approach in terms of, uh, of changing prescribing. Here's a bunch of resources in terms of different online tools that you can 
you can look at. So the next one is the mentorship model, and this is evolving, especially in the West. Um, who, does anybody use ECHO out of University of New Mexico, the ECHO program? Does it, okay. So ECHO program um, was born out of the University of New Mexico to treat hepatitis C. What they realize is that there's a lot more patients with hepatitis C than there's hepatitis C providers. Okay. So the University of New Mexico said, okay, here's my people that need access to us. There's not enough specialists that know how to do this. And so what University of New Mexico did is they had, we, or pardon me, they had monthly seminars to train the providers in the small communities to treat hepatitis C. Then those people that got trained went out and, and did those complex patients. Okay, so they met monthly, and they started with a little didactic session, and then they allowed the people that were on the call to talk to one another, present cases to the physician and the pharmacist that was running the ECHO program, to discuss complex cases, to discuss what they would do next, and then they would go out and treat the patients. And so they had a constant monthly resource where they could come to for questions and for answers and for guidance and for mentorship and review of data. Okay. So um, in the West, there's a number of people that have started to do this for stewardship. So New Mexico started to do this, Nevada started to do this, there's a group out of Seattle that's charging a monthly cost for this that's doing this. Folks up in uh, Rapid City in South Dakota are doing this. And Emily and I are, are both starting to do this, University of Utah and at Intermountain. Okay. And we, we don't really know what this is going to look like. Intermountain is going to start this fall with this and offer a one-year free pilot. If people want to join, they want to be part of this, great. We're going to see where this goes. Okay. Um, but what these services do is it provides direction, especially with data review. You can say, hey, I got my defined daily doses. Can you help me interpret that? Sure. Let's look at that. It would allow you all to converse with the small hospitals at Intermountain to say, hey, this was my problem. How did you overcome it? Okay. Um, we can give you education for that. We can regular schedule virtual meetings, but you won't have access to ID clinicians in between. It's not like you can just call us up on the hotline and say, hey, can you help me take care of this patient? We just don't have the staffing yet to do that. But that's another model to say, hey, I'm just going to reach out and engage some providers like Emily and I that do this we sleep and eat and breathe this and, you know, ask us. Um, the next one is outsourcing. This is the Cadillac model, or I guess now it's the Tesla model. Um, this is, there's a number of groups that are doing this that are offering telehealth stewardship, um, where you essentially say, we want to engage with a telehealth company that we want you to come in and do our ID consults and also run our stewardship committee. Okay, and they come in remotely through whatever type of virtual communications you have. Pardon me, you have. Um, the issue with this is it requires funding. Nobody's going to do this for free. Um, and it requires significant bandwidth from the IT standpoint to get this set up, which I'm sure if you talk to people, they will help gladly do it for you if you paid them. Um, and it requires the physician to be credentialed in your facility. It requires them to have a license in the state. Um, so it's certainly a much more advanced um, type of way to do this. Um, Intermountain has a telehealth program, infectious disease and stewardship telehealth program, that we provide for our 16 facilities. We're planning on adding two facilities to see if we can make this work, but we're not going to add any more after that. Okay, we may expand after that if that's an issue or it's something you would like to kind of go down, but it's not something we offer at this point, um, just because we don't have the bandwidth to do it. This is our telehealth program that we were able to hire. Um, two physicians, a pharmacist, a data analyst, a nurse ops person, and we, we, can, we do this for our Intermountain hospitals. We do full-time ID consults. You can see the little cart or outpatient clinic, whatever, we, we do full consults that way. And we also do stewardship support where we're a member of the team, but we don't lead the team. Every hospital still has to have a physician and a pharmacy champion. We're there to help interpret data. We come to their meetings remotely, typically, um, and we provide them with central resources in terms of data and education and care process models. Okay, that's what we were able to do for our smaller facilities. I think the biggest point is the point that Emily said, is that if we're going to have an impact on the national crisis of antibiotic resistance, we all have to be involved. We can't have it be just something that the large academic medical centers are doing. We all have to be involved in this um, because it's going to impact you all personally. It's going to impact your patients, and it's going to impact us. Okay, so this is something we all have to be committed to, not just in the state of Utah, but across the U.S. Um, start a program. Do something. Get creative. You've been here. You now have the tools to actually get out and do something. Um, you're going to have to be creative in small hospitals. Just there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, I've seen hospitals that a nurse has just 
educated, this in this case herself, in terms of antibiotic prescribing. She carried around a Sanford guide, the antibiotic guide, the little books that people used to have. And she would look at every patient, look up what they said, look up what was in the Sanford guide, and she would make recommendations based on that, the impact that antibiotic prescribing. Okay, that's getting creative. That's just saying, let's just figure this out. Find somebody who's willing to do it and engage and just do it, okay? Um, start small and measure something. So just start, try to find something to measure, whether it's adherence or days of therapy or defined daily doses or an antibiotic timeout, measure something and start. And when you get stuck, reach out for help. You know, we'd be happy to help you with this. We've both mentored small hospitals through this process um, and just send us an email and we'd be happy to, to, to help out and say, hey, think about this or that and kind of get you over the hump um, in terms of uh, thinking about this. Um, and that's it, that's my email, so if you have questions.